So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, digging in with TPS MTSU. We're really excited to be back with you all. Um, this is our first webinar since the end of last school year. So it feels like we've had a very long break. Um, and again, really excited to be back with you as we kick off a new school year. Yeah, um, so as we get started here, um, just a couple of things. Um, again, we love when folks are able to join us live. Uh, we like to have a lively uh, chat going on. So for those of you again with us live today, be sure to keep your mics muted again, because we are recording this for folks to be able to view later. Um, and we'd like to have a clean audio for that. Um, be sure that we are seeing your first and last name in the uh, in the participant list. And so that will what's pop up in the chat box. Um, and we do love for our webinars to be um, as interactive as possible. So go ahead, open up the chat box, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining from. Um, and why don't you go ahead and tell us what your favorite holiday is, since our topic for today is civic holidays. Um, we will do some reactions and sometimes we do polling. So again, just trying to keep things uh, interactive for those of you able to join us live. If you're watching this later on on YouTube, uh, again, we invite you to join us live when you can uh, to get that interactive element. Um, but again, we understand sometimes it's nice to be able to watch these on your own time. Um, we do have a Padlet where we have been adding resources for this series since it got started uh, back in 2020. So it's been going on for, I think, it's our 30th session today. Um, and so you can access all of the resources for today's session, as well as all of the ones we've done in the past um, here at this address. And we'll drop that in the chat box. Or you can use the QR code here to be able to open up the Padlet to find, again, the resource for today, as well as all of the other digging in webinar sessions. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Stacey Graham, um, who's going to talk with us about our theme for this month. Thanks, Kira. All right, I'm going to share my screen so that we can all look at the newsletter together. So I hope that you are now looking at the very first page along with me. And uh, we have done... Um, we did an issue way back in 2012 on what we called ethnic celebrations. And so that was kind of a holiday focused issue. We also did something in the very first year of newsletters ever, I believe on, uh, it was within another issue, uh, like May holidays and celebrations. Uh, but it had been a long time since we had thought about um, holidays as a teaching tool and how they came to be. And we really liked uh, the idea of focusing on civic holidays, since um, those are the ones that we all have in common uh, as citizens. And so first we had to figure out, well, what are the civic holidays? Uh, some of them are obvious, like July the 4th. And some of them are less so. Um, so I learned a bit myself uh, what were officially deemed civic holidays by the US government. So um, of course I <laughs> went to Wikipedia and Wikipedia said that there were 11 federally recognized holidays. So I want to ask you all to drop in the chat box what you think those 11 ones are. Kira, you're gonna have to moderate. So, all right, so we have Veterans Day. Okay. Labor Day, Memorial Day. Good. Fourth of July. Oh, yes. MLK Day, President's Day. Good. We know these because we get these days off work, right? <laughs> That's how I keep track. Um, so Columbus Day is not one. We, we have to work that day. Unless you're a bank. Well, 
All right, so they're someone not, else's they're, Thanksgiving. They're not state government branches. Or, um... Okay, so I am going... and New Year's have also been added to the oh, discussion. Oh, that's right, New Year's. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to move this black bar. There we go, so that I can reach this. So uh, here we have New Year's Day, MLK Day. It's actually called Washington's birthday for reasons that we explore on page four. So we'll get to those later. Um, Memorial Day, Juneteenth, our newest one. Uh, Independence Day, Labor Day. Oh my, look at that. Columbus Day is a federally recognized holiday and I we need to petition MTSU to be closed that day, I think. Uh, Veterans Day, and then I was at Thanksgiving, of course. Um, but I was surprised to find Christmas Day on here because that is very clearly a religious holiday. And I had always thought that there was a very clear separation between religious holidays and civic holidays, but it is recognized as, you know, it, it is just federally recognized so that so many places can legally close, you know? Um, so I thought that was really interesting. All right. Well, thanks for participating in our little quiz. That was a bit of a warm up for you. Um, so yes, the ones that we explore in this issue, uh, Kira is going to talk about what the difference is between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Uh, our newest graduate research assistant, Deja Gooch, is going to talk with us through her lesson idea on Thanksgiving. Um, I'll talk about Labor Day, um, which of course just passed. And then we have, of course, four additional things as we always do on page four. Flag Day is actually not one of the federally recognized ones, but each state can recognize additional ones uh, to the federal official list. And this is something that gets considered as you know, a civic holiday on a lot of state calendars. Um, and then President's Day is what we know it as, but officially it's still called Washington's birthday because that's how it was celebrated all the way until 1971. So that's, I thought, I, I don't know, I, I just, I learned a lot about President's Day uh, and it's not, just um, about, you know, adding Abraham Lincoln, but it was also a move to make it a Monday holiday. Uh, there was a law that was passed. <laughs> the, uh, the Monday Holiday Act in 1971 that allows us to take three day weekends. Um, so I know it felt weird when July the 4th was on a Tuesday this year, I wonder how many people took off that Monday because we're so used to the idea of these things being consolidated. But uh, we'll never have to worry about that for President's Day because it's always going to be on a Monday. Um, okay. Well, in that case, that was your little intro. And I am going to turn it over now. Uh, Kira, did you want to go first? Or are we going to... Um, let's Deja here. I think we can let Deja go first. All right, so this is Deja's first time presenting at a Digging In webinar. So everyone, uh, please welcome our newest graduate research assistant. Hey everyone, can you hear me pretty good? Yeah, okay. So let me share my screen real quick. <laughs> okay, can you guys see it pretty good? No, no, not not yet. Okay. It yet. It's, it's you, you, it, this is always the tricky part where you have to share the screen and then click on. Got there it. you go. I think there it's we go. Okay. Yes, now we can see it. Okay. okay. And let me present. So I did my lesson plan on Thanksgiving. Uh, part of it is because it is my favorite holiday. I love food. Um. Um, so I did start, I don't have a full slide for the typical, um, you know, pilgrims and Native American story that we get told from the time where, you know, young kids doing the turkey hands and uh, all those coloring pages and such. Um, but 
So yeah, I just went ahead and skipped on to the next. So um, what I did mention in my lesson plan, um, I talked a lot uh, or talked about uh, essentially how Thanksgiving and the relationship to war, um, I didn't get to do as much as I wanted because we have limited space on that uh, in our little blocks there. Um, but what I did want to focus on is how beginning in uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, Washington uh, made this declaration for Thanksgiving and for Lincoln uh, during like the pinnacle of the Civil War for Wilson, um, for President Wilson and then Roosevelt as well. We have that same theme of uh, push for American unity, patriotism, and uh, basically a boost in morale, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. So uh, for Washington, of course, um, it wasn't while he celebrated. Uh, we know about, you know, the initial Thanksgiving in 1621 between the Pilgrims and uh, the Native Americans. Um, but the uh, colonies actually uh, celebrated Congress uh, twice a year during the war uh, was actually putting this thing of a uh, humiliation, fasting and prayer. And I can I've got the link here as well. If it lets me I don't know if it will. Okay, it will not. Okay, so here, uh, this is just a document for it that uh, basically is saying humiliation, fasting, prayer. We're basically trying to boost morale of uh, of our people and those fighting in the war. Oh, I can't, can't see my. Okay, there we go. And then, um, so a few years later, um, after the end of the war, he actually declares a full Thanksgiving and prayer. And I think also that's just, um, we are giving thanks, but a lot of the times when we think of themes for Thanksgiving, uh, we do usually mention more so to, in my opinion, of Native Americans and pilgrims, which is true. Um, that is the origin of the holiday. Um, but we are seeing the beginning of this recurring thing of Thanksgiving um, following war. And then next we have the Civil War. Um, so Thanksgiving, even though Washington made this big proclamation saying we're gonna give Thanksgiving, um, it's still not widely celebrated throughout, um, throughout the US. Um, and then during this time, of course, uh, the country's divided during the Civil War. And I actually have a short link in the uh, lesson plan for the newsletter if you got a chance to look at it. Um, that Sarah Josepha Hale, she actually known as like the godmother of Thanksgiving, she uh, advocated for like 15 years. She was an editor um, writing all these like recipes and like uh, trying to push people for like this unity of Thanksgiving, just like uh, year round, not just necessarily when there's war going on. Um, so she wrote this letter in 1863 and within that same year, uh, Lincoln actually proclaims a day of peace, harmony, tranquility. And this is also, again, at the height um, of the war. It's not even uh, the end of it, which I think is pretty cool as well. Um, trying to, you know, bring both sides together. And then here also, uh, I have Woodrow Wilson. Um, during World War I, we also see again, you know, another war. Um, Thanksgiving is nationally celebrated at this point, and it is, I believe, declared on the last Thursday of the month uh, of November. And then, uh, so these U.S., like, so after essentially um, the U.S. joins uh, the war, then Woodrow Wilson makes this declaration, we need to come together, which the country had already been doing. But I think just the emphasis of trying to, you know, rally everyone together, um, create a sense of, uh, I guess, peace about entering this war, um, just this whole theme of I think we may have lost Asia. Yeah, it looks like she is for her screen is froze up here. So hmm. well, hopefully she can come back and join us in a couple minutes. Poor Deja. Poor Deja, the first the one. First one. All right. Uh, 
All right, so what we'll do while that is coming back is I will we'll skip ahead and kind of go into our Memorial Day versus Veterans Day. Um, so then hopefully she'll be able to come back and join us in a moment. So let me get the right one up here. All right. So for my um, lesson idea this month, when we were talking about civic holidays, I immediately uh, proclaimed that I wanted to do Memorial Day and Veterans Day um, because it is one of my growing pet peeves that people seem to really struggle with understanding the difference between the meaning behind these two days. Um, so I thought, you know, kind of getting into a little bit about the history of these two would be interesting. Um, and of course, hopefully we can... Uh, share this with some students and maybe have a few less people out here kind of confused about what each of these two days means. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, we'll start with Memorial Day. Uh, of course, it begins uh, actually not as Memorial Day, but as Decoration Day. Um, and the exact time and place uh, of the first one is unknown. Um, you know, there are different places in the country that proclaim to be the first place to recognize it, but uh, it is not, uh, no one is agreed upon about where the first one was. Uh, there is, it is known that there were um, many communities in the South during the Civil War that did have women who were going out decorating the cemeteries, honoring um, those who had lost their lives in the Civil War. So we do know, of course, it is kind of rooted um, in remembrance of the people who died during the Civil War. That um, is agreed upon, just in the time and place of that first one, not. Um, but we do kind of date it, the kind of official national celebrations of it, to 1868 uh, and to General John Logan, who was commander of the um, the GAR, um, who declared May 30th of that year uh, as Memorial Day. And he says in his proclamation about this that it was for the purpose of strowing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who had died in defense, who had died who had died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city village and hamlet churchyard in the land uh, and so that was really kind of where um the history for memorial day starts um the first national celebration is held in 1868 at arlington national cemetery which is interesting of course because it is a place where both uh, Confederate as well as Union um, soldiers had been buried. Um, so as we kind of proceed um, after that, uh, kind of in the first, uh, you know, observations of the Decoration Day um, around the Civil War, it really starts to evolve when we get towards the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, the name changes to Memorial Day. Um, and, you know, like here we see this image here on the left, uh, we see that it begins to expand not just to people who had lost their lives during the Civil War, but also to people who had lost their lives in other American conflicts. Um, and so that really uh, is formalized, though, in 1971, there is a federal law that is moved, that is uh, passed that moves the date to the last Monday in May, uh, and then officially extends um, the holiday to honor all soldiers who have died in any American conflicts. Um, I included the image here on the right because, again, it notes that, it, you know, it being called Decoration Day, and we see the kind of images of the soldiers in between this image of the, the, the cyclist here. So that's a little bit of background on Memorial Day. So for Veterans Day, um, it, of course, its origins date uh, to actually Armistice Day. Um, so it's so what it was originally known as was Armistice Day, uh, November 11th, 1919. Woodrow Wilson proclaims that day uh, as Armistice Day on the one year anniversary of the ceasefire uh, for World War I. And his quote, uh, as he declares that day, Armistice Day, is to us in America, the reflections of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in the country's service and with gratitude for the victory both because of the thing because of the thing from which it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given america to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the councils of the nations 
And they proclaimed that that day would be celebrated with parades, public meetings. And what I found really interesting is it was a two minute suspension of business at 11 a.m. sharp that day across the country. Um, in 1938, they, Congress passes a law to make Armistice Day a legal holiday dedicated to world peace. Uh, and of course, this is tied uh, right around the beginnings of, the, of World War II. Um, by the, you know, the 19, you know, with World War II, the day kind of is expanded to, you know, really kind of honor veterans of both world wars. Um, and then by 1954, um, the November 11th is designated to honor veterans of all U.S. wars. Um, but what I found really interesting uh, in kind of the history of how Veterans Day became a civic holiday um, is in 1968, there was this push to move the holiday to a Monday. Um, and kind of keep it rooted in a Monday, like Stacy was mentioning a minute ago, which uh, kind of gets into holidays and their economic purposes. Uh, but there was pushback on this because of its significance, again, being tied to Arms of Day and the, the importance of November 11th. Uh, and so that by 1975, um, it was codified that Veterans Day would have to remain on November 11th, which is why it is still observed on November the 11th. So for the lesson um, ID here, the thought was is really kind of to start with giving students kind of a brief history of both days and allowing them to compare those histories. Again, thinking about how both of these are rooted in conflict, um, you know, the significance of that, how they've changed names and expanded meaning over the years. Um, and we've linked in there to some different uh, secondary source pieces that the Library of Congress has um, available that you could use for those background pieces. And then what we want to do is kind of compare and contrast some different primary sources that really kind of get into the meaning behind these two holidays. Um, so the source for Memorial Day that we used um, is this program from uh, Memorial Day from the Grand Army of the Republic, which again, the uh, gentleman who proclaimed it, General Logan, uh, that he was the commander for the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, and so really kind of, this is a six page program piece, but you can really just focus on kind of these two pieces that I have uh, here on the screen. So kind of the cover page. Um, so we see that um, that image here where again, we know it's again, our fallen heroes. Um, and again, talking about, you know, you know, what is a world day about? And here we see right there in that kind of, you know, emblem again, talking about those who have lost their lives. Um, but what I found really moving, of course, was this poem, Our Fallen Heroes. Um, and it reads, lightly press the hollowed ground. There are martyred patriots sleep bow down the head in grief profound and o'er their smoldering ashes weep that our loved country might be free they died they died for you and me above them bid the old flag wave the dear old flag they love so well the ensign which they died to save dear freedom's starry sentinel flag which the nation's joy to see they died to save to you and me call from flora's fragrant bowers choicest of the gems of spring or their graves in rosy showers, scatter them and softly sing. For celestial liberty, they died, they died for you and me. So again, this poem really kind of speaks to the, you know, the significance, the, uh, the soberness of Memorial Day, what it means honoring those who lost their lives, uh, and again, tying it to patriotism. So you have that that you could dissect with students. And then for Veterans Day, um, I found it, this really kind of interesting uh, connection to the song God Bless America, uh, which, you know, a little bit of background on the song and kind of why it ties into Veterans Day. Um, so, of course, written by um, Irving Berlin, um, he started writing the song in 1918. So, again, uh, around the time um, that we have the end of World War I and Armistice Day. Um, but didn't think that it fit with what he was working on at the time. So kind of laid it to the side. And then 20 years later, um, again, again, starting to get into conflict in Europe with World War II, um, he goes back and kind of revisits this idea that he had for this song. Um, and so finishes it in the fall of 1938. Um, and shortly after finishing it, it is picked up and performed by Kate Smith on her radio broadcast on Armistice Day uh, that year. And uh, it is an instant hit once she performs it. 
Now, I was actually found uh, a clip of her performing this uh, on YouTube, uh, and we're going to pause the recording because I'm not sure about copyright, and I know, you know YouTube will check on that for our recording. Um, so if you're watching this again later on, know that you can kind of come back and look at this, uh, the PowerPoint for this and access the clip. So I'm going to pause the recording for just a second, and we're going to listen um, to her performance of this. Your resumer. So listening to her perform, one, her voice is, is kind of, again, perfect for this song, uh, but it can really kind of, again, speaking to um, patriotism, to love of country, and of course, to, you know, dedication and sacrifice um, that, of course, all of our veterans make um, as they go and defend our country. So we can think about, again, using the song, it's, it's kind of ties to, you know, to Arms This Day, to Veterans Day. To patriotism what does that mean how does that really kind of even speak to the meaning of uh of this holiday so what we want students to be Off able to um is to kind of conclude after they've had a chance to look at these sources and compare and contrast them um and discuss them with you guys as a class is to think about how each of these sources kind of reinforce the meaning of each of the two holidays um and again understanding how the holidays are are yeah, there there are some similarities between them, but how they are each different um, in what they are meant to signify. So um, again, hopefully this will help people to you know not get the two confused quite so frequently. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And was Deja able to join us again? Yeah, I was. All right, my computer no restarted. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So we'll just let you hop back in where you were at. Okay. Oh, let me do that. Hopefully that works. Okay. I'm not sure where I cut off, but I can. Uh... It was around Woodrow Wilson, I think. Wilson. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, what I was kind of getting at, again, with this like recurring uh, theme of uh, giving Thanksgiving um, during World War One, uh, the Thanksgiving was already being widely celebrated uh, nationally. Um, but once um, the U.S. had joined World War One, uh, Wilson declares this day of Thanksgiving as if it it's never occurred. Um, but I do think part of that is more of a reinforcement of like, oh, hey, we're reinforcing this idea of, of peace or not even peace, just uh, patriotism um, among Americans. And then once uh, the war is over, um, he actually declares another day of Thanksgiving, kind of like the beginning, um, the entrance of the US and then the end of the war is like a, hey, you know, we made it through, uh, kind of similar to me, um, with Washington as well. Um, and then also we have uh, Roosevelt, who is our, the end of the switching back and forth of Thanksgiving. Um, so during World War II, um, Thanksgiving again is widely celebrated on the last day of uh, November, last Thursday of November, based on, a, on, on Lincoln's declaration. And so once the depression is coming to a close, um, World War II is beginning. Um, Roosevelt's justification for uh, changing Thanksgiving to the fourth Thursday is to uh, allow these businesses uh, more more shopping and more patrons uh, to try to help that out. Um, and I, again, I think it is pretty cool. It is used um, as a way to bring people together for war, but it's also a way to rally people together and try to help these businesses out um, by declaring the fourth Thursday. Um, and I can. I link it if it, oop, it might not let me. Yep, don't, okay. <laughs> um, it is, it will let you click to the link uh, with the with the PowerPoint that Kira may have emailed you all. And then um, after splitting Thanksgiving, so when Roosevelt made this declaration in uh, 1939, a lot of people had already come to this, like, oh, you know, we've got football games. We've gone out of school like we've made all these plans for Thanksgiving to be the fourth Thursday and so from 1939 to uh, 1940 there were actually two Thanksgivings um some people just refused to comply um 
And so then by 1941, Congress actually declares uh, Thanksgiving to just stay as the 4th November. So everyone's, you know, in a cohesive thing. And then in a way, again, it is also like fostering that idea of unity, just as we saw all the way back uh, with Washington as well. And then I just have like a little timeline here that shows, you know, starting from uh, 1621, uh, you know, first Thanksgiving is recorded in uh, Washington in 1789. He makes his proclamation of Thanksgiving and prayer. Um, and then in uh, 1863, uh, Sarah Josepha Hale, she writes this huge letter advocating for a national union uh, to Lincoln. He likes what she's got to say in her letter, uh, basically writes up a document saying we're going to uh, foster peace and harmony. And I, and then again with Wilson and Roosevelt, um, same thing. We just kind of went over, but I just, I just, I do think that it's interesting um, in itself just to see how it starts as in 1621 as oh, you know, we're just uh, bringing together like two different peoples from two different sides of the world, and then it becomes this uh, national identity that uh, the U.S kind of takes on upon itself um, and and patriotism, which I think is pretty cool. But um, I did have in my lesson idea is just talking about how um, results of war is Thanksgiving. But I think one of the bigger ideas that you could ask your students is like how uh, holidays in general uh, foster unity and how that brings us, you know, out of these feelings of, uh, I guess I don't want to say down and out, but kind of that idea of just moving, uh, moving along with uh, the things that we face. So that's my idea. That's all I've got here. Thanks, Deja. Sorry about your computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it happens to all of us. Um, all right, well, now we're going to move to our third uh, lesson idea that we focus on in this newsletter, and it's on Labor Day. So I'm going to share my screen and go back to the newsletter and start going through that. Um, so since we just had Labor Day, uh, this Monday, that means this is a four day week for us, right? Uh, so what did you all do on Labor Day this year? Anyone have a cookout or a picnic? It was really hot, so that may have altered your plans. Anyone spend time with family or friends? Um... So we, have, so we what? have some folks who rested, some folks who did some work around the house. So some of that personal labor that we all yeah. have to do. Oh, yeah. As little as possible. Yeah, that was about with me. I tried to do as little as possible. That That's what I wished for. Um, yeah, I, uh, because my, my daughter's birthday was on, on Monday this year. So her birthday fell on Labor Day and everyone always makes the joke to me that I must've been in labor on Labor Day uh, 12 years ago. And um, yeah, so a different kind of labor. Um, well, did anyone participate in a parade and carry a sign about how we should advocate for better working conditions? No? Not this year? Well, I bet there were a lot of Hollywood writers who were doing that very thing on Monday. <laughs> because we labor strikes are still a thing and therefore learning about the labor history of America will always be relevant. Uh, and you should be able to find something to connect your students to what's happening in the news today to what these workers tried to do um, over a hundred years ago. So, you know, the Hollywood strike would be one way to kind of get into this topic, I suppose. Um, okay, so um, 
this is a lesson idea that kind of asks about what it what does Labor Day mean? You know, how many people and, and, and of course, every holiday has this, you know, I guess it's not a problem so much as just a tendency that it, we are reverent and we are observant, but sometimes we aren't as observant of the meaning behind each and every holiday each and every year. It's just that's that's something that's hard to fit in um, and something that's hard to maintain emotionally. Uh, but this asks about, okay, so what does this mean to all the different people involved and what does it mean today? And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad for not working on Labor Day because that's why those workers struck for better conditions a hundred years ago so that we could have, so that we could enjoy the fruits of our labor under better conditions today. So uh, the very first Labor Day observation that is recorded in the United States, again, one that's been officially recorded, who knows what has been kind of celebrated more informally, was in 1882, and it was in New York City. And it is significant that it took place in the Northeast part of the United States. There were a lot of immigrants there. There were a lot of people who worked in factory conditions. This is the Gilded Age. Uh, this is the second industrial revolution. So we have a lot of working conditions and a lot of people um, being pulled into more working conditions that are less than ideal. And um, so there's a lot of attention being drawn to that. And the workers themselves are starting to pull together and um, do things collectively, which of course, will, uh, this is also the time of the birth of the major labor unions. So um, Labor Day is not an official holiday in 1882. But there was this parade and it was a bit haphazard, as you can see. Now, I'm going to uh, show you what some of these different links link to. Um, so there is from the U.S. Department of Labor, a page on the history of Labor Day, which is more than appropriate. Um, so this is a bit uh, who's the founder of Labor Day. It's a bit of a dispute between two dudes named McGuire. Um, so, again, that's talking about uh, the Irish immigration uh, in the Northeast um, and, you know, what, the, oh, I'm sorry, what they did. And then uh, September 5th, there's a Today in History article at the Library of Congress talking about this very first Labor Day in 1882. And why did I call it haphazard? Well, uh, going back to the Department of Labor's website, Labor Days, D-A-Z-E, Fried Chaos and Kegs on Labor's First Day. I thought that was just a wonderful title. Somebody, some board worker at the U.S. Department of Labor must have had some fun with that. Um, so uh, it's because it was, you know, obviously firsts tend to have some logistical issues and they were there was no band and how can you march in a parade when there's no band and then somebody heard that oh the jewelers union has a band but it's a few blocks over we got to go get them and so it kind of got off to a weird start and then when people were done walking around they just kind of ended up going to the nearest tavern and drinking and i i'm not surprised they probably would have done this no matter what holiday it was right um but it, it's just kind of a a, a bit of a personal interest story uh, to talk about that. Uh, and there is a video from PBS that talks about Labor Day that's very short. And you can show that to your students to start off uh, kind of this discussion of what Labor Day is and what it means. So it talks about the first Labor Day and then it talks about when it became a federal holiday. So, um, so the first question about meaning is why might people want to celebrate labor, like celebrate it in 1882? And that's when you want to bring in the context of this kind of the working environments. Uh, and of course, in the South, uh, there was increased industrialization. And so there were more of those types of jobs in the South. But people, a lot, the 
greater number of the population were still working in agricultural jobs. Uh, maybe a lot of people were sharecropping and tenant farming. Um, and so there, there were a lot of issues related to those types of jobs too. Domestic laborers, which a lot of women who had to work would do, um, that was across the whole country. And so it's more than just kind of the factory image, you know, that we get from the Northeast that tends to dominate these discussions. But uh, so a lot of people didn't know how to take this very first Labor Day. And so there's a newspaper article that reacts to it. Oh, did I not tell you where it was? Which one is it? Pardon me. I usually uh, I usually like crop these and put them in their own um, PDF and um, make a whole make it very easy to find. So uh, my apologies that this one is here we go. A labor demonstration. There we go. There was little in the parade of Tuesday in this city or in any of the many descriptions which were yesterday published of it or in the speeches which were reported as having been made on the occasion, which gave it or them the character of a labor demonstration. There was nothing in the appearance of the men to indicate that they were suffering for good clothes or were weak from long famishing. They were not only neatly and comfortably, but in many cases rather extravagantly dressed. And they not only marched briskly in the sun for many miles, but a great multitude of them danced briskly and listened to rather dull speeches for the better part of the afternoon. There was no bread, but plenty of beer provided for them, and they had change to pay for it. The gathering had none of the aspects of a bread riot, every semblance of a picnic or a political barbecue. So what does this person want? Do you have to be like destitute and too weak to march in order to advocate for better labor conditions? Anyway. I... So uh, hopefully your students will notice the overbearing tone of that and that can be kind of a springboard to discussing Okay, why why this attitude? Why this resistance? Uh, why might the sight of people advocating for better labor conditions not please everybody who's not directly involved? So um, that's the first. There's another newspaper article further down. So it wasn't made a federal holiday until 1894, which is something that is mentioned in the video. That's something that the video does not mention is the fact that the federal designation of Labor Day as a holiday is a direct reaction to a very bloody incident that happens during a labor strike in Chicago. And um, this was a mass strike and uh, it was the American Railway Union, which was a new union. It was formed by Eugene Debs who would be a five-time presidential candidate and later a member of the Socialist Party. Um, and this is against the Pullman Company, which of course is very big in terms of, uh, you know, the owning and operating railway cars. And so basically uh, had their hands in every single, um, you know, had a direct impact on so many different railway workers, not all of them, but the ones who worked in the cars. And so they had, there was, a, there was a financial crisis going on in this country, by the way, at this time. And so that impacted the Pullman company and they lowered, they had to lower wages, but they were one of these companies that also owned the places where the workers lived, like a company town. Um, and so they, they lowered the wages, but they didn't lower the rent that the workers had to pay to live in Pullman Company housing. And so the workers were like, that is not fair. Uh, so they struck. And Grover Cleveland was a Democrat, and he was elected with the support of workers, and people were expecting him to be in support of the workers. But because of this financial depression going on in the country, he had to make a lot of concessions. And so he wasn't as supportive of labor unions and workers as a lot of people had hoped that he would be. Um, but 
Other unions also opposed this, including Samuel Gomper's American Federation of Labor, the AFL. This is before it joined with the CIO, of course. Now, one thing I want to point out is that I know that Eugene Debs and Samuel Gompers are both mentioned by name in your particular curriculum standard. This lesson idea doesn't go into their involvement, but it does link to two other resources that we have on our website uh, that are about them. So there's one that looks at a close reading exercise, looking at two excerpts of speeches from Eugene Debs, uh, their anti-war uh, during World War I. And then there's also a close reading exercise that's kind of in the form of a, a worksheet uh, that members of a, one of the labor unions that's under the larger umbrella of the AFL, um, it's actually an African-American branch. Uh, they are coal loaders uh, down near like um, Newport News in Norfolk, Virginia. And, and they're writing to ask about a raise. Uh, and these numbers are so tiny, they're, read, they're reckoned in half cents. That's what makes a difference to these people in the year 1917. So we do have those two related resources. That's where those links come in. So um, the president declared the strike was a federal crime. So that basically made all the workers who were striking for better conditions, either higher wages or lower rents, criminals. And then, of course, the soldiers come in, violence erupts, and some people are shot. And there is a blurb in a, an exhibit, in the American Treasures exhibit at the Library of Congress, um, that discusses that in kind of just a short paragraph with an accompanying page from the New York Times. And this is a newspaper that's not in Chronicling America. So you can't actually look at this more closely in a different part of the website, but you can see the headlines. Um, and so, uh, well, the president actually feels badly that uh, this strike turned out so violently. And so when uh, Congress tried to pass, um, you know, Labor Day as a federal holiday, you know, President Cleveland's like, well, I didn't support the workers, but hey, I could throw them this bone here uh, and I could at least give them this holiday, right? And that's that's a kind of snarky interpretation, but uh, based on what, you know, the amount that I read about it, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And um, I know that Heather Cox Richardson was a bit nicer towards Cleveland when she wrote about this in her blog a couple of days ago. So, and then this also, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna read more newspaper articles, but I do wanna show you that it does link to another newspaper article that talks about it. And this one, I do tell you where it is, middle of the fourth column. And I, I think that might be the same one one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's the same one that we were looking at uh, right there. So that's where I wrote where you were supposed to look. I just linked to it twice. But if you want to look at Labor Day as celebrated in other years in the United States, because, you know, every different era in the U.S. has a different approach to labor, there is a Topics in Chronicling America page about Labor Day where they pick out a some select articles so that you don't have to spend all your time searching through Chronicling America and they pick out like the best ones and you can use those in class without having to, you know, it's a more efficient use of your time. There's also a lot of more resources that the library has in uh, Labor Day Roundup, uh, a blog entry that they did back in 2013. There's, um, an early video of a Labor Day parade. There's a bunch of links to related primary and secondary sources. Um, so there's just, you know, not the first Labor Day, but labor in general and other Labor Days um, in American history. And then lastly, there is a whole research guide uh, from this month in business history, which is not something that I usually look at, but it's incredibly useful. Uh, so it's 
print resources. So these are things that you can find maybe in your local library um, that maybe students who are trying to develop a bibliography can use if they're doing a research project, maybe something for ten uh, Tennessee History Day maybe. This is a great place to find more things to use. Uh, and then internet sources, both at the Library of Congress and outside the Library of Congress. So it's not just Library of Congress things. So that's the story about the origins of Labor Day. And I am going to stop sharing and throw it back to Kira. Thank you. So um, as we near the end of our hour together, just a couple things that we want to mention. Of course, you can find um, links to some other resources around holidays, some of the holidays we didn't mention today, such as MLK Day or Juneteenth. Um, listed in the important links section there on page two of the newsletter. Um, blogs, I, I know in my own research for this month's newsletter, there was tons of great information in some of those Library of Congress blogs. So again, if you um, are interested in kind of you know, small bite-sized chunks of information with some links to some cool sources, those can be really interesting reading. Um, the other thing that I want to mention before we wrap up is uh, we featured information about the upcoming Tennessee Council for History Education Conference in this month's newsletter. Um, if you're not familiar with this conference, it's been ongoing. This will actually be the 16th year for the annual conference. Um, it is taking place in Nashville the last Wednesday of this month um, at Scarrett Bennett. Uh, which is over near the Vanderbilt University campus. Uh, and our theme for this year is civil discourse in a not so civil world. So kind of a civics education oriented uh, theme for this year. Uh, we will have with us um, Joe Smith, who is with the Bill of Rights Institute, who is our keynote speaker, um, who's going to be talking some about, uh, his presentation is going to be oriented around is a book that he just published, again, about civics education and ways that we can um, kind of do a better job with that in our classrooms and with our students and why it's important. Um, in addition to, to having him as our keynote, we've got a lineup of great speakers um, for that conference, uh, Facing History and Ourself, the National Civil Rights Museum, the Tennessee State Library and Archives, just to name a few. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, Stacy has dropped the link for the TNCHE website. There's a whole page about the conference there. Um, I invite you to take a look at that. Um, we do have a, there's a group rate special. So if you're able to, you know, get, uh, you know, three more of your colleagues to go along, you guys can go for the price, uh, three, four can go for the price of three. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out to me. I'm actually also the state coordinator um, for that group. So I'm happy to answer questions about the conference, but it's a great opportunity, um, again, to connect with other um, history teachers, uh, history professionals, um, as well as academic historians, and can kind of share where we're at with the teaching of history um, in the state right now. So hopefully um, you guys will come out and join us for that. Um, as we wrap up here, a couple of things, just a reminder. Uh, again, you can find the links for everything uh, from today's session on the Padlet. Uh, and, you know, just like Deja mentioned in her presentation, she had lots of really cool things linked there that you want to take a look at with mine. Of course, you can access the, uh, the YouTube video of the singing of uh, God Bless America through that as well. Um, if you're interested in receiving uh, PD credit for uh, participating in today's webinar, um, just uh, use the QR code here to access the short survey, or we'll drop the link uh, in the chat box uh, for those of you who are with us live. Um, I check this about once a week and send out certificates. So again, um, feel free to, to complete that, and then you'll get your certificate in the mail. Uh, we will be back next month um, on October the 12th. Um, our theme for next month is Turning Points in U.S. History. Um, so we'll be, again, talking about some again, important moments in, in U.S. history that really kind of shifted the course of the nation's um, movement going forward. Um, the last thing that I want to do for today's session um, is give away a book. Um, so again, we are so excited to be back with you guys. Um, so I am going to spin our wheel and we'll see who is the winner of today's prize, which is Sam Weinberg's Historical Thinking and Other Unnatural Acts. So let's see who our winner is. Sharon. 
congratulations, Sharon. If you want to drop your mailing address in the chat box to me, or you can email that to me either way. Um, again, we want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope to see you again next month. Uh, so yeah, so thanks. Have a great afternoon, everyone.